Hey folks, Coach Patrick here in Durance Nation, and welcome back to another weekly Coach Chat. Uh, today is Monday, January 26th. It is Snowmageddon here in New England. I hope you are safe and warm wherever you are. Tonight is the third part of four of my installment called Patience and Discipline, the Art of Season Planning. Um, and my goal is to take you through uh, this third component of, of what I want you to think about when you're crafting your own season plan as a self-coached athlete, um, and uh, I'm going to walk you through tonight. So the format for tonight is a little different. Um, I'm going to recap parts one and two, launch into part three. I'm going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes, um, and then I'll open up for you guys to answer your questions about your season or just any general questions that you have. So if you are not interested in season coaching or season planning and, and, and the art of self-coaching, then you know hit the snooze button for 20 minutes and then come back, and I'll see you in the chat room. Uh, and I'll answer your questions there, okay? This is a full-on recording uh, that will go uh, live to the interwebs, as it were, as we go. All right? So I'm going to fire it up. Oh, before I do that, though, let me make sure you guys can actually hear me. You guys want to let me know in the chat room that you can, in fact, uh, can you hear me? Let me see. Uh, audio confirmation last week or two weeks ago I did an awesome presentation that nobody heard uh, so okay awesome uh, <laughs> John no problem I just want to make sure I do you know I'm I'm not the uh, the smartest guy in the room but I do learn often from my mistakes not a sign that I show my wife very often but I do learn and I do I do try and get better okay so without further ado here we go Hey everybody, welcome to part three of Patience and Discipline, the Art of Season Planning for the Self-Coach Triathlete. Uh, tonight is part three, where I talk a little bit about what it means to use critical performance components um, as part of your season planning and overall athletic planning process. Before I begin with part three, let's go back quickly and recap about parts one and parts two. In part one, I talked a lot about mapping out your race, the actual visualization process, not simply saying, um, hey, I, I want to go, you know, 11.59, or um, I want to break, you know, uh, you know, three hours and a half uh, Ironman run. Um, and not just coming up with some sort of arbitrary number, but actually taking the time to put yourself visually in that place and asking yourself a series of questions that basically work you down from how do you feel at the start, how do you feel uh, in the middle of that leg of the race, um, what's your mantra, what's going through your mind as you're thinking of, as you're executing that part of the race. Uh, what's the time on the clock when you finish? What, what's that time that you visualize? So time at the end of this process, finishing with the delta. What's the delta? You know, think about that swim. What is that swim? How does that swim feel? What do you see on the clock when you get out of the water? Bam, you tell me, Patrick, you know what? I see an hour and seven minutes. And I say, all right, well, you know, what's the delta to your swim right now? Well, you know, I swam an hour and 12 um, last year. I want you to go through that process because, again, it's so easy to just say, I'll take 30 minutes off of, of everything. You know, 10 here, 10 here, 10 there, and now I'm 30 minutes faster. If it were that easy, we'd all be doing it, right? So I want you to go through that process. So in step one, you went through that process and identify those deltas. In step two, we talked a little bit about the season planning process being, what is your training window? How does it work from where you are now to when your A races? And, and the, the goal behind that segment was to get you to define exactly how much time you have left to train. So I want you to appreciate uh, the constraints of your year. Um, time is a very funny thing. We uh, think about it in, in one of two ways. Essentially, we have lots of time until we need to do something, or we have no time to do anything about what we have to do. It's got to happen tomorrow. So as humans, we spend a lot of time thinking about what may happen one day and simultaneously panicking about what has to happen tomorrow. Uh, and to be truly effective as a self coach athlete, you've got to carve out room for yourself athletically in that middle space. Um, you know, hallmarks of successful self coach athletes are people who are really good at defining what they need to do to train and, uh, and, and creating time and space for that training to happen. Now, I myself am a key um, example of that and also, um, you know, to a fault almost, I'd say, very good at carving out time for my training. I'm very good at knowing what I need to do and how to be successful. It's also a function of you know, being at the game for over a decade. I've got a very uh, narrow sense of, of what success is and, and how to define it. But I don't apply that same rigor to other areas of my life, be it, be it work or 
um, extracurricular pursuits or anything else I want to do. So um, it's definitely something that I have focused for my training, but not elsewhere. I'm asking you, who are probably very good at many other things, to put yourself into my shoes and say, all right, hey, how am I going to define this window? So an example would be you're having this conversation with yourself in January, and your big race you want to do awesome at is, um, say, Ironman Wisconsin. So you've got basically nine months between now and uh, Ironman Wisconsin to get your to get your work done. Uh, and in reality, since you're probably not training right now, maybe you need a month to kind of get up to speed. So it's called eight months to get ready um, for Wisconsin. So you're talking about a certain amount of times that you want to create change in, swim, bike, and run. And then we're talking about how much time do you actually have to create those changes. Okay, um, so the third part here in the third installment, I want to talk a little bit about critical performance components. Um, and this is kind of a parallel journey. Okay, we've talked a lot about you. We talked about your goals, your deltas, and we talked a little bit about your time. What's the time frame you have? Now I want to talk a little bit about endurance agent and how we structure your year. Uh, and the goal here is to give you a sense of how um, a basic season works um, so that you understand um, how things operate. Okay, and I'll get in more and a little bit into it as we go here, and I think it'll become a little more um, a little more clear to you as we go along. Okay, so number one, <clears throat> these critical performance components are essentially the building blocks of your season. Um, as an endurance nation athlete, many of these elements are already uh, included in your training plan and in the uh, triathlon season roadmap process that we lay out for you, uh, whether it's Coach Rich, who does the majority of plans, or if you're working with me, Coach Patrick, as well. Um, and so we spend the time going through um, your plan, uh, your uh, races, your strengths, your weaknesses, and assembling what we believe to be the best possible set of options for you. Um, uh, there, I break these critical performance components down essentially into three different levels. You know, level one being more of the beginner entry level, level three being more advanced. And generally, people move from level one through level three over time. Um, and as they move through the process of accomplishing these goals, they're also obviously moving through season. So in many ways, the critical performance components that I'm going to show you here in a second are very um, are very similar to the three-year plan that we have created for endurance station athletes. The three-year plan gives you, uh, from a time-based perspective, how things work from you know season one to season two to season three. What do we want you to focus on? From a critical performance component perspective, now I'm giving you insight to um, some of the granular details of, of actually the, sort of the uh, things that we want you to check off the list and accomplish. Okay, and I want you to see these things because I want you to understand that outside of your um, general, excuse me, time goals, like I want to be faster on the swim, faster on the bike, or, or stronger on the run or whatever, inside of those time goals, there's multiple ways to achieve those. It's not simply about going faster um, or becoming lighter. Um, there's a whole framework within which your year works, and it's important for you to understand that, both as an endurance station athlete tuning in now, but also as a self coached athlete understanding that you wouldn't just make a plan based around one element. You know, If every single workout was based on saving you five minutes, um, your workouts would be, would be um, uh, skewed uh, towards that one perspective, and you'd miss out on lots of things, like the critical components of drilling, of recovery, of doing different speed work, but also the tempo work and maybe some, some endurance work. So um, while the end goal is to have you make up those five minutes, how you go about creating conditions for those five minutes to be obtained is a much uh, more uh, lengthy process. It's not simply a function of saying, I think next time the gun goes off, I'm gonna swim faster, right? Because if, again, if it was that easy, we'd all be doing it, all right? So that said, we're gonna try something a little different here. I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can share my screen with you guys. Where is what I'm trying to share with you guys? Hold on. All right. Okay, here we go. So this here is basically my chart for you on what I see as um, the critical performance components is built out for endurance nation, okay? Um, so uh, what you'll see here is uh, level one, level two, and level three. So again, moving, um, moving from, uh, from left to right across the border, basically, um, Let's see, here we go. Moving across the board, okay, I wanna make sure you guys can see me here. All right, from left to right, you can see how things work here, okay? And as you're as we're going through the process of, of moving, basically, I want you to understand that things, 
um, incrementally work on a time-based perspective as well. So as you're looking at column, column one, then column two, then column three, understand that it's also a function of moving across time and experience, okay? So level one, those are the easy critical performance components. These are things that we expect out of everybody. And we expect them immediately here in your first year. I expect you to remain healthy. I expect you, um, uh, through your training and, and smart uh, execution, to be consistent and build, start building durability. I'm going to put you through our out-season training program, and I'm going to you know, force some serious uh, threshold workouts on you, make you super strong. And along the way, I'm going to have you work a little bit specifically on your swim as a skill development item in the first year. Right? We want to have that comfort in the water, make sure that you're good, kind of get that set in stone. Okay. From a racing perspective, it's all about mastering race execution in year one. All we care about is you execute and exit in a year, being ready to execute a race and knowing what that's like. Okay. Then we move on to the second level of critical performance components. Training, we have adding cycling volume as a means of boosting your overall fitness, which also falls into the category of additional endurance. Uh, we add functional strength here as a second level um, to help you both sustain uh, proper form, uh, but also maintain speed when, um, when others cannot, okay? And then from a skill development perspective, we add the bike to this as well. Want to get better at riding the bike, more nuanced in climbing, descending, cornering, braking, et cetera, as well as continued um, focus and development on this one. Racing perspective, this is a time when you gain a lot of race experience. You know, once you've mastered it at level one, I want you to head out on level two, spend a lot of time out there racing. You know, some in, a lot of times in, in level two, people will do three or maybe four half iron races in a year or a, a myriad of other races as well, just to kind of get lots of racing experience under their belt. And along the way, they'll also be refining their race execution. Then finally, people move to level three. In level three, our focus and training shifts again now. Uh, we're going for the harder elements. We're going for run durability. We're gonna start focusing on body composition. We're gonna really get into equipment selection, you know, skill development again, still on the swim, but now also talking about run, run technique, running form. And then as well, we go through racing perspectives. We're gonna start really researching your races, making sure they're the right ones for you uh, from a elevation perspective, timing perspective, temperature perspective, et cetera. Uh, we're going to do more race-specific training and need perhaps even have you select two A races this year, one as, a, you know, kind of your go-to and one as a backup, you know, should something go wrong. One, multiple opportunities to put your A race out there and, and really let it go. So uh, what does it mean when you have this chart? Well, essentially, you know, when I think about this chart, um, for me, um, as your coach, um, let's see here. What I think about, you know, for me and as your coach, hold on a second, I just want to... Uh, Stop screen sharing. Here we go. All right. So for me as your coach, what I'm thinking about explicitly is, is having you uh, move left to right across these objectives, but also um, move so in an aggregate way. In other words, <clears throat> I want you to get really good at all the things in level one. When you move to level two, uh, you, don't, you don't get to forget about level one. You've still got to keep those things going. All right. So um, for example, in level one, we talk about uh, staying healthy. We want you to remain healthy that's that's a goal for every year that you execute and train the years where you are where you are unhealthy we make poor decisions about your fitness about your training those are the years where things come back to haunt you or you miss a six or eight week block of time and from an overall perspective it's a tiny blip but it does take away um, from your progression and so staying healthy is important and i expect you once you've understood that and built a, a training week and a recovery mechanism that makes sense for you that we continue to implement that week to week moving on forever, okay? Um, same thing uh, with your functional threshold fitness. It's not, it only happens in, in level one, it happens for the rest of the years as well, but it's really important in year one to help you redefine what it means to do work, but I, I expect you to do it every year. Now, as a level two athlete, looking at the level two critical performance components, guess what? I expect you to do all of the things in level one, and I want you to add functional strength. So I'm, similarly, when you move to level three, now I'm starting to talk to you about body composition. You don't get to give up functional strength and you don't get to give up being healthy or durability, overall wellness. Uh, the net is that as you move across each section and you become more and more experienced as an athlete, parts of these different components essentially just become who you are as an athlete. You are, these are habits. These are not extra things you do. They're just what you do. You know, like, um, you know, if I told you, hey, every morning you've got to get up early You've got to go downstairs and boil water, and then you got to get these beans, and you got to grind them, and then you got to put them in paper, and then you've got to pour the hot water over it, and then add some sugar, and then when it's not too hot, then you're going to drink it, and you got to drink all of it, 
And then you got to clean all that up. You'd be like, man, what a pain in the ass. It's drinking coffee. You do that without thinking about it. And a lot of what we're talking about here is the same deal. I need you to go through this process of making these things just bulletproof habits that you do and you move along the way. The other reason why I think of, why I want to show you these critical performance uh, components in a, in a set of columns that move left to right over time and experience level is that I want you to understand that, that some things shouldn't come first, okay? We've all seen that person out there who's riding a $10,000 bicycle, but, um, you know, could lose 20 pounds. And um, we've all seen people out there, and I've got people who are like, you know, hey, I just um, bought this book about triathlon and my sister-in-law dared me to do this uh, race in six months. I want to do it. You know, uh, where should I put my feet in my running form? You know, and for me as a coach, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, running form is the last thing you need to be thinking about right now. We need to build this awesome schedule for you that you can execute. I want to get you consistent. I want to keep you healthy. Uh, I'm going to start hitting you with a little bit of intensity, see where we're going. The form thing, it's going to sort itself out. If there's a problem, you're going to notice some feedback, and then you and I can deal with it. But I don't want to put the cart in front of the horse. And we generally, as type A athletes, will always overcomplicate things um, just by virtue of how we approach solving this racing problem. Leave the solving of the racing problem to the training plan. You as an endurance station athlete get the advantage of using our plans, using our progression, and walking yourself through this process. So what you see here is level one, level two, level three. That is essentially how endurance nation works. That is how we walk you through the different levels of preparing yourself for a race in a given year for excellence. Now you as a self-coached athlete will look at this and say, all right, well, hold up, hold up, hold up. I see you're talking about swimming all the time, but listen, you know, I'm a former competitive swimmer. You know, I fall asleep swimming 120s in the pool, which is ridiculously slow for a swimmer. But guess what? I'm off the front anytime I swim with you triathlon, yeehaws. So what's up with all the swim time? Or, or maybe you're a runner or a cyclist. If you bring some form of uh, athletic pedigree to the table, that, that certainly um, takes some elements off the table, but doesn't exclude you from a sector. And what it does is it gives you opportunities to focus on other areas and perhaps explore them more deeply. Any um, perceived strength that you have showing up to the table um, as a single sport athlete in the, in the sport of triathlon is just as much a strength as it is a weakness, right? Um, you might be a phenomenal swimmer, but we don't swim that same way in a triathlon and you're gonna hurt yourself, right? No race has ever really been won on the swim. Um, you might be a phenomenal runner, uh, but guess what? Runners usually bring a lot of injuries to the table, very low durability after all those miles. And typically, runners can't eat for shit. They, they, they literally have no idea how to eat. They're so lean that they miss one fueling cycle in an Ironman, and their day's over. They're gone. Skinny guy out the back, done. You know, nice, big, meaty guy like me goes trucking right on by. Okay, uh, And so uh, your strength may be just as much of a weakness uh, as we shift from a single to a multi-sport perspective. So you're not necessarily off the hook, although it may change the perspective with which you approach your training. Okay, so um, let me dig in here to my notes a little bit more. People wanna know um, <clears throat> also, you know, why do I stack things out in an order? And, and one of the biggest reasons I do it is not necessarily that part A needs to come before part B and part C. It's also important to remember that most of us are essentially running at 95% capacity all the time. There's, you just, you're not most people who has lots of free time. You know, if you ever follow um, a professional uh, triathlete or professional athlete on social media, you'll see they spend a lot of time playing video games, hanging out, training, recovering from training, buying food to eat during the training, talking about their training. Um, what they're not doing is carpooling, uh, dry cleaning, uh, taking kids to school, volunteering at the school, volunteering in the community, um, you know, doing stuff uh, for their neighbors, you know, food shopping um, for an army, apparently, right? Buying gas, taking the car to get fixed, you know, you name it, whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that average people do all the time that sucks energy away from just this little tiny training space where you wanna see excellence and performance. And so one of the reasons why we stack out these critical performance components over time is that um, it is all too tempting to say, oh my God, I wanna be awesome next year. I am gonna start dieting now. I'm gonna buy a bunch of new equipment. I'm gonna train like I've never trained before. I'm also gonna start going to the pool. Oh my God, I need to get massages. I'm gonna do this hot yoga thing. You throw six new things on top of your already crazy life and it just blows to smithereens, all right? You know, take it from me, I've been coaching for over a decade. I've seen it happen. I've tried it myself. I've experienced it myself. 
You know, if, if you want to do all those things, I welcome you to the world of falling asleep at your desk until the light's going out, not being able to keep track of what your coworkers are saying, falling asleep by like 9 p.m. every night, um, you know, bringing a two liter bottle of Coke to your swim locker at lunch so that after your swim, you can just drink bottles of Coke before you go back to work where you will actually just fall asleep at your desk. Right, no, no uh, physical performance gains there. Trying to be two separate humans, this awesome elite level athlete and awesome you, worker bee, family person, etc. At the same time, it doesn't work. Two pieces of matter cannot coexist in the same space. Those two lifestyles have a very difficult time existing in the same space. Very few people can do it, and I'm here to tell you that it's just not worth doing it. Let's let's stack it out and build it across uh, your. Uh, your life cycle, if you will, as an endurance athlete. Okay, if you can build your your capacity from year to year, all of a sudden, um, you know, by the time you get to year two or year three, or you know, level two, level three, from a component performance component perspective, all of a sudden, um, you're very strong, uh, very experienced, very nuanced athlete. You bring a lot to the table um, over someone who just has a brand new shiny bike. Okay, super duper important. Okay. Um, in the next installment of the series, I will talk about what it means to um, take the deltas that you'd earned in, in level one and then start to work them into your actual year itself. In other words, if you've got an endurance nation season, excuse me, where we talk about out season, swim camp, early race, volume, and race prep, we talk about your season as a constructive whole, and we know you've already got worked in this level one, level two, and level three components, where are you gonna, where are you gonna really focus that swim time for the biggest bang on your buck? Um, because it's not it's not enough and it's not effective to say um, it's January and come September when I am, you know, swimming in the waters off of Monona Terrace, I'm going to go five minutes faster. That's not enough. You can't hit your January swim sessions like that. But there are some critical periods of time within your overall training cycle where you can see significant gains in your swim form. Um, and so we're going to highlight some of those areas for you in the next set and final segment of patience and discipline, the season planning process for self-coached triathletes. This is Coach Patrick from Endurance Nation. I want to thank you for tuning in for another um, weekly coach podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you check us out online. We are the world's largest and fastest online triathlon team, creators of the first time finish guarantee and the four keys of race day execution. We are age group coaching professionals. This is all that we do. We help thousands of people cross finish lines every year. We'd love to help you as well. Go ahead, join the team, create a free seven-day trial, and check it out for yourself. Um, now, I'm going to wave my arms like this, do a little Wayne's World action. I'm going to head over to the chat room and see what people on the team are asking me. Um, answer your questions, whether it's about season planning or any questions in general uh, for the remainder of our coach chat time tonight. Thank you very much for letting me uh, get in here and uh, chat to you about my broader topic as well. I really appreciate it. I super enjoy getting in there. All right, guys. Who do we have in the chat room tonight? I see Bill, Kathleen, Doran is here. Hey, Doran. I got Doug, Ed, John, Mary, and Vic. Mike Roberts is in and out. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the cool things about being on the team is the opportunity. Um, to have these broader discussions and really um, generate the conversations with athletes can help them where they're at. So Doug's asking, coach, what about, what do you mean by functional strength? Strength training? I do. I mean, um, um, I can dive into it more and we certainly have resources uh, in the wiki for it as well. But that functional strength, yeah, I totally mean, um, you know, examples would be like all body weight exercises or even with bands, you know. Um, I think a lot about <clears throat> the, um, Exercises related specifically to help you be a better triathlete. So for running, I think a lot about um, activating the glutes, clamshells, um, bridging, single leg bridges, um, like a lower back exercises, right? Uh, stretching your, your calves and, and, and strengthening your calves. From a swimming perspective, I think a lot about upper body flexibility and work. So swim cords certainly play a strength role in the upper body. But there's also a great deal of just mobility and flexibility work you can do in your upper body um, to prepare you to swim well. And you see that now 
um, and the uh, new um, resistance program Coach Rich has created to carry through the offseason as preparation for some camp and moving into the rest of the new year. Um, and so I think a lot of people are tempted to say, well, you know, I'm over 40, I need to get into strength training, got to go to the gym and just lift a bunch of weights. Like, don't get me wrong, um, there is a fitness component, especially as you get older and, and uh, retaining muscle mass and lifting weights is a, is a phenomenal way to stay healthy over time. Science backs that up for sure. Um, but from a straight performance perspective, you can't ignore uh, the benefits of some complementary um, strength training to just keep you in that zone. You know, for example, I can't get in the pool seven days a week. I can only get in the pool three days a week right now. But on the other four days, I can do my swim exercises as a means of making me uh, more flexible and more um, attenuated to the things that I want to do in the water by engaging the right muscles in the right order, et cetera. And that carries through to all elements of your sport, okay? All right, let's see. <clears throat> Bill asks, is there any relationship between the beginner, intermediate, advanced training plans and the levels three years left to right chart? Um, there is, Bill. It's a great question. It's not necessarily linked up like, you know, uh, an advanced athlete is not simply doing a level three work. Um, there are people, I think, that the beginner, intermediate, advanced levels um, really speak to what you bring to the table. So you may be in your first year, but you may be a phenomenal athlete, athlete in general. It doesn't mean that you automatically get to skip to the end of the, uh, the food line and just check out while everyone else waits there. Um, you uh, will be on the advanced plan based on your ability levels and the training load you can handle and your lifestyle, et cetera. Um, but you still have to go through those basic elements of staying healthy, uh, mastering race execution, et cetera. You know, I have, I have worked with more than a few people who are incredible athletes and passionate and committed about our sport, like the likes of which you have never seen, uh, but they just are unwilling to talk about race execution. They, they believe that they know the way, um, even though their way has been proven wrong to themselves and to everyone else for decades. Um, they still believe that they know what they're doing. They just haven't gotten it quite right. And it's a very challenging as a, as a professional, as a coach, to work with these people and, and build them stronger and make them ready and then know that every time they go out there, they're messing it up. And you can see it, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, so for us, we build in that race execution expectation. It's in everything we do. It's in our community. It's in our language. It's in basically in our fabric of how we operate. Um, and so that still becomes important. So um, while it's a little bit to that effect, <clears throat> I would say that it's more about the season planning process. So when you are a veteran on the team, we start talking about run durability. We start talking about equipment selection. I'm not telling a brand new athlete when I call them up on the phone in their first week to go out and buy you know, a P5 um, or to get the latest gadget um, or to start losing 50 pounds. You know, I talk about setting um, very achievable goals and putting them on a schedule. So part of this exercise right now is me giving to you guys kind of the framework with which I operate and speaking with you um, so that you understand how I wanted you to progress, okay? Ed's got a question for us. Ed says, what stroke rate do you suggest that we try to get to? <clears throat> Matt Dixon's book suggests 70, and I'm comfortable at 40. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the biggest fallacies about swimming, Ed, is that there is one right way to do it. Um, I think it's easy to say that for running uh, because from a running perspective, uh, running cadence can be generalized around, you know, the general height of the overall population. The majority of people are between, say, you know, five, five and six feet. Um, it's very easy to sort of say, hey, a, a rough cadence should be about 90. I mean, go from there and taller people are I'm probably more 86 than I am 90 and, and shorter people maybe more 94 than 90, but hey, they're the outliers. Let's focus on this cadence. <clears throat> I think um, the big difference with swimming is that uh, feel for the water is so different for each person. So um, let's put it this way. If um, you and I could talk, you know, cadence running all we wanted, but if I told you that you are running blindfolded, kind of cadence is the last thing you're thinking about right now. You're like, I want to make sure that I'm not going to fall over, I'm not going to hit a wall, um, that I'm not going to trip over something, um, I'm not quite sure what my legs are doing now, I can't see them. And that essentially is what swimming is. When you put on goggles and you throw you in a pool and you've got to hold your breath, all of a sudden everything that's around you goes away. You're, you're in a very narrow, narrow box. Um, and so 
Um, I look at stroke rate as kind of the last level of improvement for me um, around where I want to be. And I think, so I would work backwards. The question I would ask and what I work with um, swimmers, especially this time of year, we're really focused on, on good swimming, quality strokes, not worried about volume. Uh, for example, even though I'm training for an Ironman in May, um, I'm only swimming 2,500 right now um, because I really want to focus on good swimming. And, and good swimming actually makes you really tired. It's easy to just kind of win your arms around. Um, and so for me, um, good swimming for me is um, slowing down my stroke enough to let my body fully rotate in the water so I can set up my catch. Setting up my catch through proper rotation, which for me means slowing my stroke rate down a little bit, right now is important. Over time, as I refine that catch and my ability to catch, that stroke may, may come up as I look for more speed. But right now, I'm slowing it down to where I get that catch right, okay? Um, the best way to see that is on video. Because what I found was I personally had also upped my stroke rate um, using a metronome. Um, and yes, I was measured it, and my stroke rate did go up. Um, and there was some speed there because naturally when you turn your hands faster, you will theoretically go faster. Uh, but what I didn't realize was I was almost predominantly using all shoulders. I wasn't actually engaging the broader muscles of my back uh, and the muscles that I was supposed to be using for propulsion. Um, and so it was almost like pedaling with my calf muscles. Like I got crazy tired really fast. It was uh, almost instantly anaerobic. I wasn't using the larger muscles in my body. Um, and as an athlete, I could do it but it was certainly not optimal. And so what I found now going back to a slower stroke rate, not necessarily just slower in general for everybody, but a stroke rate that allows me to rotate and set up my catch, which I think is the fundamental element of what we're talking about when we think about stroke rate, that has allowed me to kind of get back into that sort of more diesel, steady, not super fast, but I can do this all day kind of effort. I look forward to bringing that focus back to my swimming this year, okay? Kathleen asks, run durability? I am in my third year of EN. Yay, yay, God. Should I be more durable? <laughs> Interesting that you said that about a lean runner in an Ironman run and missing one meal is death in an Ironman. That's me. <laughs> well, I can't cry you for Kathleen because there's a bunch of people on the team, I'm sure, who would love to be skinny uh, just like you. Um, over time, uh, durability comes with experience through the sport. But in your third year, if you refer to the three-year plan inside endurance one of the options for you is to actually follow the run durability protocol. Uh, Ed, for example, is on it right now, which is more of a season-long perspective of how we build up your run versus looking at it from a compartmentalized approach of you know out-season, general prep, race prep as these individual widgets that we move around, but rather a season-long perspective of how we take the fact that you've done multiple years of intensity uh, over time and then moving forward. In general, it's reserved for people who are um, you know, looking for kind of a breakthrough on the run, which is how the whole conversation about the run durability project started. Um, so some people, even though you're in your third year, you might still be looking for a breakthrough on the bike or an overall breakthrough athletically, which is still focused then predominantly on the bike and uh, race execution. Uh, but when you're ready to start having that conversation and shift it towards the run, that's when we can start talking about run durability. Um, and you can read about that in the wiki under the uh, three-year plan and the run durability project. Okay. Vic says, hey coach. With a goal of Ironman Texas in May of next year, 2016, how would I look at my year? Is the, is the race the end of the year, or is it just not ideal to do an early race or what? I would say I'd like to do some stuff this year, but at what point this year do I say this season is over and next season begins? Um, Vic, that is an awesome, awesome question. I really, you guys are on point for, uh, for it being 9.30 on a Monday night. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with you guys. Um, from a season planning perspective, um, we generally work um, uh, in chunks, and the general chunks for us, the out season generally starts, uh, you know, October, November timeframe, usually end of October. Um, so call it November 1st, uh, and that runs through March. That's kind of the kickoff to our season. And for me, uh, the, the, the season starts with the out season, and it's kind of the um, that's when we kind of reset things and say, hey, it's a new year. When, and I, when I ask someone, you know, when they say they've been on the team for a while, I say, well, how many out seasons have you done? Because you can say you've been on the team for three years, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you've done three seasons. And three out seasons lets me know just how long you've been actively on the team, right? So for me, it really starts with out seasons. Um, so if you're focused on Texas of next year, 
I would work backwards to that November start and say, hey, you're training for Texas next year, officially for next year starts in November, and it will start with the out-season period of time. So you have between now January and next May. So you have between now January and I would say October to put together a great year, okay, and build up. Now when I think about um, what's great about that, and I talk about this in the second installment, the second video, is um, the fact that your timeline is, is, is not nine months, but your – you know, your, your timeline is essentially 16 months. It gives you like that much time, right? So uh, we get to work backwards, essentially, like we do everything inside the organization. And I'd say, wow, November is your kickoff time. So October, we're going to kind of chill it. I want you to be aerobic, but I don't want you to do anything crazy. Uh, so I want you to, you know, kind of be active and fit, but really no marathons then, please. <laughs> no crazy races or whatever. So final racing could happen in that August, September time frame. Um, what those races look like this year in general, I recommend some half iron or 70.3 distance races. Um, that's a great level of training that is close enough to long distance tri training um, without the cost of all that money. All right, so I would say you could probably pick a season of two races. Maybe you do one race this year in May, June, and another one in kind of August, September. You kind of get two full cycles of proper training. That also gives you some room across the course of your season to insert some additional volume. Now, some of these answers I'm giving you now are more indicative of the next topic, part four. I talk about inserting these critical performance components into your endurance nation season. But um, I would say that uh, elements that you can always include um, as you think, you know, with an eye forward towards Ironman is um, all the cycling you get your hands on. So if there's fun cycling events, Grand Fondos, Century Rides, whatever, light them up, ride them up, put the bike miles on your legs. Um, it's easy to go from as people just discovered at our uh, January volume camp, it's easy to go from 30 miles a week <laughs> or 40 miles a week to 250 miles uh, in just three days uh, because it's a bike and you can handle it. So the great thing about adding cycling volume is you could be training for half or, or even less on a short course plan uh, doing just, you know, 100 miles a week and then decide you want to ride a century mile that weekend. You can do it as long as you pace yourself properly and fuel it. So um, cycling volume is always welcome. Okay. Um, another element that you might want to work on, and I usually recommend, is a lot of open water swimming this year. Uh, just because it depends where you live, but for most people, um, uh, Texas is early enough that open water swimming is not a, an option. And so, in a sense, you kind of go from the pool directly to the open water, <laughs> which is less than ideal. So, you know, putting some time in the open water this year, focusing on it a couple of times, kind of banking that mentally, saying, hey, I'm doing this mentally to prepare myself for next year when I won't have this window. I like that concept. It may not be easy to execute, but I like that concept. Um, uh, and that's really it. That's kind of the, th the things that I would look at. I would also plan ahead uh, for you and say, look, I've got this race next May. Um, what do I want to do? Like, for example, we have this January volume camp. In January, we put up some big training across the course of five days. You may want to attend that camp. So maybe instead of doing three races this year, you say, I'm going to take this money and put it to camp and just do two races this year or, or, or whatever. So you may budget accordingly to help you um, set up your training properly so you can do well. You know, one of the reasons why um, I really enjoy the January volume camp is that it really helps me break up my out season. I did it last week. I got in some great volumes, recharged my batteries, allowed me to kind of move to the next level with my training without slogging through a bunch of other weeks. And it gives me that mental break as I refocus and look forward to Texas, okay? Awesome. All right, guys, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. It is, it is 940. I'm probably going to get yelled at uh, by my wife. But I want to thank everybody for showing up. Please go back to the forums, the dashboard, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Tell people we had an awesome coach chat tonight and that Coach Patrick is here every other Monday night talking about something crazy and answering your questions as well. I'm always saying I'm always on the text line. You can find me on Twitter. I'm on the site. Answer, answer, answer. Online, online, online. Love working with you guys. Love talking with you. Uh, lots of great stuff coming up this year as two-time Ironman tri Club World Champions. We've got to keep the ball rolling. We've got to uh, keep things moving. Uh, I love your feedback and your input. And I look forward to giving you guys the installment of part four, uh, which may come out. I, know, I may not be a chat. It may just be a YouTube video next week. But all this will be going up uh, in the wiki and presented to you guys in the newsletter as well. So you'll have it. Okay? Thanks so much. For those of you in the snow, be safe. Shovel smart. Uh, those of you in the sun, Shut up. I don't want to hear about it. It's Coach Patrick from Endurance Station signing off. Have a great week, everybody.